Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us in our complimentary webinar series for U.S. federal government contractors. We're coming to you live from Washington, D.C. today. You probably found out about today's webinar through our newsletter, which reaches over 23,000 federal government contractors and service providers. Today's session is complimentary and also recorded. You can find the recording on our website and our YouTube channel about 24 hours after the webinar, though usually even sooner. We have over 540 complimentary webinars on our YouTube channel. This includes all 52 parts of the FAR, all 52 parts of the DFARS, and hundreds of webinars on strategic and tactical topics. If you'd like to advertise in our newsletter or in any of our upcoming webinars, please email us at hello at jennifershouse.com. And a little bit more about us, we are a specialized consulting firm focused on working with established federal contractors. We work with product, service, and software firms across the globe. For more information about our services, you can visit our website and select About Us. And as I mentioned, today's webinar covering the FAR supplements is complimentary and recorded. We began this series in January 2022, and you can find the past recordings on our website and the future schedule with the registration links. Um, but here's just a look at the schedule. Um, after today, we only have one more FAR supplement, so um, that's crazy, but you can find um, all the recordings of the past webinars, um, again, on our website and on our YouTube channel. And then on Fridays, we cover the same agency or department in our playbook series. The Friday webinars discuss upcoming bidding opportunities, contracting trends, small business resources, and they often feature a government speaker. Um, so our our next one um, will be the Department of Veterans Affairs on the 26th. Um, you can find those on our website under the Playbook tab. And please join us for our specialty webinar series covering executive orders, House and Senate committees, and how they impact federal contractors. These webinars will be complimentary and also recorded. The registration links are within the slides that will be sent out, uh, sent out to you after today's webinar. And we've added one more um, procurement playbook webinar. This time on a Tuesday, it'll be doing business with the NSA on Tuesday, August 30th um, at 12 p.m. This will be a live webinar only and not recorded. The slides are not available after the webinar. So don't miss this rare opportunity to participate. And our government speaker on that day will be taking audience questions during the webinar. And please join us for a special webinar covering cybersecurity compliance and enforcement. Our friends at Arnold and Porter LLP will be presenting in this complimentary webinar on September 30th at 12 p.m. Eastern. And then please note this fall, we'll be starting a new webinar series covering subcontracting opportunities in the different government departments. These webinars will be on Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern, and they begin September 7th with the Department of Agriculture. Again, you can find the registration links and full schedule on our website, this time under the subcontracting tab. And now we would like to thank our sponsors who helped make this webinar series possible. First, we'd like to thank the Virginia PTAC. Virginia PTAC is based out of GMU in Fairfax and offers free one-on-one -on -one counseling to firms in Virginia on federal, state, and local procurement topics. Online resources and group trainings are free with no restriction on business location. If you're interested in learning more, please use the links provided to explore what PTACs can offer. Next, we'd like to thank the Federal Business Council. The FBC creates and manages virtual and in-person meetings and events to connect industry and government thought leaders, product providers, and solutions with government programs that use them. The FBC works with a variety of federal agencies to connect government and industry in the form of in-person and virtual conferences, training events, policy dialogue, and outreach. Over the last 40 plus years, FBC has become a comprehensive resource for connecting industry and the federal government. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Next, we'd like to thank Dastin. Dastin is an IT and cloud solutions provider working with corporations, the military and government agencies to lower their costs, increase scalability, improve operational efficiency and meet compliance regulations using targeted cloud-based solutions. Dastin is a certified partner of Oracle NetSuite, a premier tier Google Cloud partner and certified partner of Cisco, Virtue, AO Docs and Authenticate. For more information about Dastin services or to schedule a complimentary consultation, please email Joe Alston. <clears throat> Next, we'd like to thank C3. C3 ISIT develops tailor-made technology solutions that increase efficiency, bolster productivity, and improve business processes. C3 is the leading provider of managed IT services as well as compliant cybersecurity solutions for federal contractors. C3 works with defense contractors to achieve and maintain CMMC 2.0, DFARS, and NIST 800-171. Contact C3 to learn more about the CMMC 2.0 readiness program. The contact information is on your screen. Next, we'd like to thank RLJ Financial. Founded in 2008, RLJ Financial Consultants is a customer-focused, quality-driven, minority, and locally-owned provider of commercial insurance brokerage services. Their services are designed to maximize your return on investment in managing the risk to your business. Call Roderick today at 202-832-1417 for a free consultation and insurance quote. And lastly, we'd like to thank the PubK Group. The PubK Group publishes news and insights for government contractors, agency, and council. Every day, PubK delivers news on bid protests, contract disputes, new laws and regulations, cybersecurity requirements, false claims act activity, and developments in mergers and acquisitions in the GovCon community. In daily news briefs and in-depth conversations and podcasts and webinars, PubK leverages its deep bench of government contract experts to keep you up to date on fast-changing government rules and expectations. And every January, PubK presents its week-long annual review, featuring more than 50 GovCon experts across a dozen panels, recapping the year's top developments. Participation and CLEs are free to subscribers. Visit PubK online at www.pubkgroup.com. Okay, thank you again to the attendees and to our speaker for joining us today in our FAR Supplements series. So today we will be digging into the FAR supplement on the Department of Transportation. So let's meet our speaker. Our speaker today is Craig Lawless and he represents the firm General Counsel PC. As a reminder, we don't take any questions. So if you have any questions for Craig, his contact information is there on the screen and it will also be displayed at the end of the presentation. You can contact him directly. So thank you um, for joining us, Craig. I'm gonna turn the slides over to you now. As I'm transitioning my screen, if you would please give me a thumbs up that you can see me in presentation mode. Yep, you're all good and you're all set. Fantastic, thank you very much for the intro. Um, Craig Lawless, I am the senior counsel at General Counsel PC. That's a law firm in McLean, Virginia, just outside of DC on the Virginia side of the Potomac. Um, I did wanna, before I start, give a shout out to Jennifer Shaws and Associates because uh, for a very long time, even when I was not practicing in private practice, I have been an avid user and my clients today are an avid user because I have several years, both as a business development lead with Lockheed Martin uh, for Lockheed Martin Space, uh, a systems engineer and program management for Lockheed Martin, and an in-house director of contracts and general counsel in-house. So if I think about what we're gonna talk about today, the relevance to these 50 or so people that are talking to us or working with us right now on this session is really what I call the right hand of a government contractor that has five fingers. And as I think about those five fingers, I'm gonna put some context into those five fingers from the standpoint that those fingers are legal, contracts, finance, 
business development and program management. So that's the hand that grabs the FAR or the FAR supplements to take a look at them for the government contracts entity. And I'll relate those contextual issues as we go through this into those groups, legal contracts, finance, business development, and program management, all of which uh, I'm a marketing undergraduate before I went to law school and the Naval War College. I don't do math in public, so I will freely admit to not having that linchpin, um, particularly on the P&L and the cost side for program managements, uh, that there is a link to uh, uh, legal. But having said that, I'll move on to the next slide. I wanted to give you a brief overview of the Department of Transportation. Uh, some of you have not worked with them before. Others have been longtime uh, providers of services as a government contractor to Department of Transportation. We might even have some members of the Department of Transportation online as well. But as a brief summary, that mission, the current mission for the department is to deliver the world's leading transportation system, serving the American people and economy through the safe, efficient, sustainable, and equitable movement of people and goods. Now. I would encourage you to do the business development if you're going to entertain this as a government contract client, because if you take a look at their strategic plan, which is available on their website, they have six strategic goals that are very impressive. And under this administration, under Secretary Pete Buttigieg, uh, himself a uh, naval intelligence officer as well in the reserve, uh, like me, um, had identified six strategic goals that the Government Accountability Office has been profiling for several years in seven issues and areas of improvement that the GAO had recommended. And those correspond to strategic goals that are coming to fruition, including safety, economic strength, and global competitiveness, equity, climate and sustainability that you'll see woven throughout a lot of their procurement issues right now, organizational excellence, and oh, yeah, let's squeeze in transportation in there while we're at it. So those strategic goals in their strategic business plan, their strategic plan that goes from 22, 2022 to 2026 is an outstanding read and vital business development uh, perspective on the values of what the department is. But if we talk a look, take a look at what the FY 2022 contract summary is, and this is available on GovSpend if you're wondering where I got that from. Um, these are available contracts that we can see now. The contracts themselves for 2022 thus far is 6.41 billion, that's with a B, award obligations, with a number of transactions of just over 23,000, and a total number of new awards for that FY of 5,000, a little over 5,000. Now, um, that's important to note. That's a lot of contracts. That is dwarfed by the number of grant awards at the tune of $72 billion that Department of Transportation has given out in this FY. That $72 billion, only 8% of their obligations have been contracts. Those other grant awards come to states, local governments, uh, academic institutions, as well as business partners as well that they have. Now, as a little bit of a detail, and I don't want to steal too much thunder this Friday, when we talk about the business development side of Department of Transportation that Jennifer Schultz is putting on, which I highly recommend. But in thinking about that terms of so what, in contracts, if we take a look at the operating agencies, those uh, uh, entities that are subordinate to the department level, the top five included the FAA at 3.8 billion in obligations, the Federal Highway Administration coming up second place at 1.1 billion, under that $1 billion mark is the Maritime Administration Agency, uh, almost $800 million, and then the Office of the Secretary of the Department of Transportation, which functions as the 10th horseman in that scheme of things of an operating agency, and I'll talk about who those are. And rounding that out significantly lower than many of the top uh, one, two, and three is the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Now, if we talk about operating administrations or OAs as they're called, the OAs that are included and recognized in the Transportation Acquisition Regulation, that's the supplement that is called the TAR that mirrors the FAR, uh, allows for operating administrations to not only be a head of contract agency or an HCA, but it also allows them to have more restrictive 
and have a higher approval as well, given to them by the TAR in 48 CFR, uh, Code of Federal Regulations, Chapter 12. Now, the bar is 48 CFR Chapter 1. Each individual sub, uh, supplement that an agent or a department has is given that lower level of authority, and that chapter corresponds, as we'll talk about some nomenclatures. But those nine, in addition to the Secretary's office, includes the Federal Administration, the Aviation Administration, Federal Highway, Federal Motor Carrier Safety, Federal Railroad, Federal Transit, National Highway Traffic Safety, Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, as well as the Maritime Administration, and another one that's the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Seaway Development Corporation. Now, each one of these, even if you're not aware of it, at the forefront of commerce and national security, if you think back to last year, the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Agency was at the forefront of the cyber attack on the East Coast Pipeline that shut down a significant portion of our fuel oil distribution. Now, if those are the operating administrations, I did want to be able to talk to you about the authorities and their orders of precedence as they relate to acquisitions for the Department of Transportation. The first is statutes, and those would be any statutes irrespective of the FAR. That includes the Davis-Bacon Act that governs wage attribution, attribution and uh, payments to construction projects for the federal government. The Service Contracting Act, the False Claims Act. Those are the types of statutes that govern irrespective of a regulation passed by Congress. The Federal Acquisition Regulation and its progeny of supplements includes the FAR, that's 48 chapter, uh, a Code of Federal Regulations, Chapter 1. In our case, what we're going to bull side on is number three, the Transportation Acquisition Regulation, commonly called, known as the TAR, and that's Chapter 12. In addition, Subordinate to the TAR are the Department of Transportation orders and acquisition policy letters. And I'll talk to you about the orders that are operative now and the three acquisition policy letters that are available. But also, very importantly, which we're not going to talk about because there's so much to talk about in the supplement itself, in the TAR, is the Transportation Acquisition Manual or the TAM. That's listed as subpart 1209.4. It's interesting because 1209, the numbering scheme in the TAR is actually reserved. I point that out because if you say to yourself and scratch your head, hey, the TAM is a manual for the in-house people that do contracts at the department. Well, that's true until you have your first bid protest or you have to get the nuances in what those issues are for the execution of the contract and the administration of the contract. And when we talk about that band of the hand, legal, contracts, finance, business development, and program management, the TAM is really fundamentally important, not only to contracts and legal, but it can also be an, un, a linchpin for what we talk about on the finance side. So those are the orders of precedence and the regulations. I did want to give a small discussion real quick, walk through the numbering scheme, because the federal acquisition regulation is codified in a Title 48 and a Chapter 1 of the Code of Federal Regulations. But underneath that chapter are part, subpart, section, and subsection. I'm going to give you an example in comparing the, nomen the nomenclature, the numbering system between the FAR and the TAR. I'm going to use as an example a part that's in the title. So not only does there is a numerical nomenclature, there is a title, a plain English, English title, a part, small business programs. And both the FAR and the TAR have the part and the subpart. Contracting with Small Business Administration, the 8A program, I selected that as just uh, as one example. And the subsection is contracts clauses. So if I think about the FAR nomenclature, that 19.8.11 tax 3 is how I reference down to the subsection. And I have a part in black, the subpart in green. The section in blue and the subsection in purple, that corresponds to that nomenclature and the FAR. And on the TAR, what we have done is we've included a TAR number, that's Chapter 12 of CFR, and we've inserted that, like all supplements, before the part from the FAR. So the corresponding is 1219.811 TAC 3. And that TAR 
corresponds in addition to a numbering system where there is not a one-to-one -one relationship. Subsection numbers, those numbers in purple, can change from time to time, and primarily those change when there is a provision or a clause. We all know the flow-down clauses that we see in the solicitation, but those clauses will change a numbering scheme when there is not a direct correlation between the FAR and the TAR. And primarily those are clauses. So we use the 70 through 89 numbering scheme, and we'll see an example of that for provisions, but also if there is operating administration unique guidance, we're gonna use a 90 and above for that, just to keep us straight. Now, to give you an idea on how that clause might look, I've selected an example randomly uh, on a part solicitation provisions and clauses, that's FAR 52, TAR 1252. The subpart section, text of provisions and clauses, mostly we see clauses that are included in flow downs or section H or I of a solicitation. And that subpart is identified as FAR 52.2. The corresponding TAR is 1252.2. And I chose the economic price adjustment as an example. And I, under the FAR, there are three subsections for economic price. I pick standard supplies, which the nomenclature is FAR 52.216-2. Now, to get an idea how that corresponds and the differences between the FAR and the TAR on economic price adjustment, the part, subpart, section, and subsec, uh, and sec, part, subpart, and section are relatively the same. On the FAR, we've inserted the 12 as the chapter identification, but the difference we see is in the subsection. That's where the nomenclature for 70 to 89 picks up when there is not a direct corresponding. So at the FAR for economic price adjustments, has three separate subsections. I picked two just as an example for standard supplies. Then the corresponding grouped area, because they're not three, there's only one clause that's used in the TAR, is 74 the subsection, and that's where you might see a disparity. In addition to this disparity, we'll see an example on how it works. If the FAR includes a subsection, for instance, if there was a parenthetical A after 52.216 tax six, and there was a parenthetical little a, but that was not selected for inclusion in the TAR, the TAR would simply show 1252.216 tax 74 parenthetical B because it had not adopted that A. So that can be confusing when you're actually looking online at the TAR to be able to see where that nomenclature leaves off at. Now, let's talk about the specifics. If the FAR is grouped into part, subpart, section, subsection, before we have that definition and a challenge in between the parts, those, numer those parts are grouped into subchapters. And the first subchapter A, I call it the overview, simply because administrative matters is already taken in 1204, and it doesn't quite work in here. But if I think about the band of the hand, legal, contracts, finance, business development, and programmatics, that focus is really on the focus of contracts management, the contracts administration, contracts team for a government contractor, and potentially legal. There is some improper business practices issue that we need to be concerned with at the programmatics level, but contracts and legal is really in that chapter A box. I group chap subchapter B, acquisition planning and methods and types together, and that's why they're both green or shades of green, because they're really solicitation, pre-solicitation and post-solicitation. Those are the functions that definitely the business development team wants to be aware of. And if they're on your color team and heading up a volume, then you're going to want to make sure that your contract team is involved in that as well. There are some other aspects of that as you transition with finance to be able to make sure that the numbers and the pricing volume work. But essentially, that group right there is solicitation, pre-solicitation, and post-solicitation. Subchapter D includes the socio and economic programs, and listing those as small business programs application of labor laws and some other compliance issues like environmental energy safety, as well as protection of privacy and FOIA. In red, mostly because I'm a lawyer and I look at 1233 protests, disputes, appeals, and part 1233 as a red flag, 
Uh, but that subchapter E, general, general requirements, includes the patents, uh, intellectual property issues in 1227 and 1228 in bonds and issuance. And I'm going to use some examples when I peel these off in specific FAR parts that I wanted you to think about. Subchapter F is special categories, definitely on the program management side. So if that green, that red box in E, let me back up to subchapter D. If I think about the band of the hand, that team that's contracts execution and program management should be very concerned with the socioeconomic side. Um, if there are disputes, maybe draw in legal as well. On the red block, that's subchapter E, I would like to be able to bring in finance in a big way on that. Um, and not just the business development people for the patents, data, and copyrights, and the legal team, but that bonds and insurance has a specific linch to profit and loss and costs that that finance team is, is critically important to make that link between the program management operations line function that your team is going to be doing and the legal side of it. Subchapter so F, I talked about that. Uh, those special categories or specific types of subject matter that the contract will be on includes R&D, construction and architecture and engineering. My apologies, ran out of space. But also service contracting and acquisition of IT. And I'll use an example on one of the clauses for the um, acquisition of IT as well. And rounding out the last two, again, the band of the hand on the contracts management side, absolutely contracts and program management are very important in that side of it. And as you get into audit, uh, particularly around costs, uh, we have some very sizable programs with the Department of Transportation. So auditing comes of a major function in there as well for finance. And then lastly, as the catch-all clauses and forms, solicitations, provisions, and clauses, that 1252, I gave an example of that. That's really where you're going to see the rubber meets the road, excuse the pun, uh, for the Department of Transportation because those clauses are going to be built in to your uh, section H and I of your contracts, of your solicitation itself. And you're going to be held to be in, included of, inclusive of that during the execution of your programs. So please, please, please don't simply read the nomenclature and the title and move on. Understand what those clauses are. And if you're a program manager after transition or you are a capture manager working with a proposal manager, make sure your team understands and can address those clauses as they come up in there. Because although it's important for execution, it's equally as important in the acquisition, pre-acquisition, pre-award. Now, I'm gonna give a couple of examples of these. Uh, some of these subparts, or some of these parts and subparts of the TAR are basically just fill in the blank because you have to have somebody identified at each department to do this. Other sections are going to show a big difference from the FAR because they're uniquely tailored issues. That's why we get a supplement, because they're unique to that department. In this case, the subpart 1205.1, Dissemination of Information, really identifies a small and disadvantaged business utilization office. That's office code S40, the address, and really important, and again, not to steal the Friday's thunder, but that listing of forecasts for the fiscal year on procurements, planned uh, fiscal procurements, is fundamentally important to your business development team and your finance team. So those things in there inside the TAR, are, it's not only a compliance with executing the contract for your contract staff. That is the moneymaker when we talk about business development and forecasting and where you can find that essential resources that are tucked into the TAR. Another example on just who's who in the zoo for the TAR is 1206.501 requirements. And in this case, the senior competition advocate, that's the individual who is not only the deputy assistant secretary for administration, and DOT has a very complicated, they have a very robust uh, he headquarters staff. And there are a significant number of deputy assistants including the deputy secretary for administration because the deputy assistant secretary for administration who is also the SCA is the direct boss for the senior procurement executive at department of transportation that is responsible for all procurement matters and the senior procurement executive is also senior to all of the heads of contract agencies when it comes down to the uh, the policies 
Uh, I did want to point out uh, another couple of examples. Contracting officers in this case uh, can permit under 1214.302 bid submissions telegraphically. Um, that's important because uh, um, if you're phoning in your bid, knowing that you can actually do that gives a significant amount of flexibility because many agencies, particularly those that are in uh, construction, will not allow that to happen. Uh, but the contracting officer can uh, allow that. Um, there are some very specific, unique issues of the TAR that go to the mission of what the Department of Transportation does. So, yes, everybody buys some level of commercial items, pens, papers, pencils, chairs, desks. But some of those unique things that we find, in this case, subpart fixed contracts for vessel repair and alter alteration conversion, are uniquely identified to maybe a handful, as in less than five, agencies that operate on the seas or in the inland waterways, Coast Guard, uh, Customs and Border Protection, uh, Navy, Army. But as we see this, we define things like lay days, meaning the time allowed to master of a vessel, uh, the master of the vessel for loading and unloading the same. Great. If you're doing vessel repair, alteration, and conversion, now you have your definition. But the clauses can be specific in what this is, and that identifies why the FAR supplement, the TAR, operates at that level. Another example, which should be near and dear, it's for the development side if you're developing work for Department of Transportation. So not only in software development, you have R&D programs. There are uh, patents uh, to be able to do a litany of structural engineering. It's important to understand that there are appeals rights on decisions for the head, that may be appealed to the head of the contracting activity. So a contracting officer makes a decision about patent rights. That may be appealed to the head of a contracting agency. For instance, actions under this section can be coordinated with the legal counsel, which means the operating activity, the Federal Aviation Administration, must have their legal counsel involved in that. Now, understand that regulations almost 99% of the time are directives from the government to the government. They catch a prime and sometimes a subcontractor, but for the most part, these are directives to, not to the prime contractor, although they will be held accountable. It is directing the activities of government personnel in executing contracts and acquisitions. Now, I wanted to point out, because this also, when I think about the team that's involved in this and in the band of the hand, legal contracts, finance, business development and program management uh, or operations, if you will, manufacturing, whatever it is, that side that you're is the line function of your organization as a government contractor, is bonds and other financial protections. Because running through that, this is one of the first substantive issues where you have a lot of subsections with a fair amount of detail in the TAR. That includes things like furnishing information and really covers surety issues where the Miller Act rights, so the Miller Act was passed to protect subcontractors in government contracts from non-payment by the prime for a variety of issues. But related into that, as we look at some of those other subsections, are the administration of bonds. For instance, the contracting officer shall notify the surety of the holder of the bond. Uh, for the surety for the bond within 30 days of the contractor's failure to perform. That's wrapped in a lot of other detail on performance and payment of bonds for certain contracts. There's a lot of detail, but as we take a look at that section, if you're in construction, if you're in manufacturing for these types of contracts, understanding where that works and understanding things like waiver inside the TAR is very important. For instance, there is a waiver on very rare exceptions, but contracts for the construction, alteration, and repair of vessels under sections 1535 and 1536 of Title 31, the Merchant Marine Act, is a grounds for waiver and what is uh, involved in that for waiving the bond requirement. Now, warranties was another robust area of the TAR that I wanted to flag for you as well. Subpart 1246.7 under warranties, those limitations include. A contractor shall not be required to honor the warranty of any property furnished by the government, except for two examples. One is the defects in the contractor's installation, 
And the second is the installation or modification in such a manner that it invalidates the warranty, right? So you had to have done something bad if the government gave you property. This happens considerable amount of time, especially in multi-part awards where there are different phases of construction projects. Think about the infrastructure bill that was passed several months ago. Think about what we're going to see in providing for the environmental impact um, and the um, uh, on the recent uh, omnibus bill that was just passed and what those are going to have as an impact on infrastructure and construction and building from a transportation infrastructure side. Now, what I didn't do is I didn't pick out each of the 12 requirements on 1246.706 warranty terms and conditions because it's significant. There are 12 requirements under the terms and conditions for warranties, and there are an additional six for major acquisitions that if you're concerned about those kind of warranties and what they entail, please take a look at those warranty sections under subpart 1246.7. Disputes and appeals. Uh, a major part of my practice right now is bid protests. So. Focusing on disputes and appeals, uh, bid protest is one form of dispute. Another form of dispute is a claim. This typically deals, these disputes in here, really has to do with the Board of Contract Appeals in claims. So a claim is any demand for payment or information request from the government, according to the FAR. So a claim can be many things. It doesn't necessarily have to be bad when you're waiting on some information. If your claim is waiting to get paid, that's not necessarily a good thing. But just like the other departments that have their own boards of contract appeals, like the Armed Services Board of Contract Appeals, both for the DOD and for NASA, the Board of Contract, the Department of Transportation Board of Contract Appeals, the .BCA, rules that pertain to this are codified also in 48 CFR Chapter 63. Important in that, is that alternative dispute resolution is heavily emphasized in the Department of Transportation. They have appointed a dispute resolution specialist, and that specialist is responsible for the Center of Dispute Resolution, Office Code C4, that looks to be able to involve that hopefully long before the dot BCA is included or the Court of Federal Claims. Now, I made it the departure from the far the tar itself because I wanted to give you what I teased out as some relevant issues to me. I don't know what all of them were, but when I looked at the substance of the tar and compared it with the far in detail, I teased out some of the things that were mostly relevant to me and how I thought of the band of the hand: legal, contracts, finance, business development, and program management, operations, whatever you say. But in addition to the tar, and I told you about the TAM, the Transportation Acquisition Manual, I did want to highlight some class deviations and some acquisition policy letters that are within the authority of the Department of Transportation to issue. The only active class deviation that I'm aware of right now is to grant a class deviation for both the TAR and the TAM until that becomes uh, operative for the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Seaway Development Corporation. And that's allowing them to provide a head of contracting agency and that is allowed under subpart 1201.4 tax 70. That's the authority that allows for the class deviation. You see a thumbnail of that on the right-hand side. Now, what's, what's important is class deviations have a certain time limit. This one was issued in April of 2021. Um, it, it's really a nomenclature issue to be able to recognize that the head of the contracting agency it, for the Great Lakes Lawrence Seaway Development Corporation is a operating administration and can act independently for their own contracting issues. That means warrant contractor, contracting officers with warrants are subordinate to that head of contracting agency, as well as the contracts as administrative staff. In addition to that class deviation, which I'm, I'm not aware of any other deviations currently for the department. In addition to those deviations, we have Department of Transportation Acquisition Policy Letters, those APLs. All of these, all this information is clearly relevant. Uh, uh, if it's clearly relevant, you can discover that on Department of Transportation's homepage. The um, link to uh, procurement is where you would find the underlying substantive documents that I'm referring right now. But acquisition policy letters are usually used for a temporary purpose. 
And, and in case when we talk about these, it's usually there's a rulemaking in the mix. It's material that's incorporated into, let's say, the TAM, or it could be so expeditious, expeditiously needed in an operating administration that there needs to be some prompt implementation of that. Typically, these are short term, less than one to two years, and these will eventually be incorporated into regulations or guidance for permanent retention. OK, but essentially it's a quick fix. It needs to happen now. But it still needs to be under records management. Um, it still needs to be done in a thoughtful process. Um, the rulemaking process can be slow. Um, complicated rulemakings can take, uh, you know, 24 months or longer. Um, but they are usually a subject matter generally limited to the contracting officer and a head of a contracting agency within that vertical of the senior procurement executive for Department of Transportation. There are three. One of them typically doesn't really relate to us. It could be a source of a protest if we found that our contracting officer wasn't a level three certification under the federal application certification and contracting. That's the fact C and that's registered must be within the Federal Acquisition Institute training application system, FATAS 2.0. Now, it can be really, really uh, important to always remember that your client is the federal government. They do wondrous and amazing things. They also pay you. But when it comes down to disputes, sometimes we can forget that. But we often need to be reminded that we have a very professional workforce and the Department of Transportation is no different. There is a significant level of certification that happens that is unparalleled. I'm a certified federal contracts manager from the um, American um, uh, from the AMA. Um, my certification was tested, but it has nowhere near the level of certification that I've done as a military officer uh, through the DEWIA process for defense, um, nor does it hold a candle some of these things. So that's an important shout out to what they do to professionalize their core that we should all remember as those outsiders looking at them as customers, sometimes in frustration, admittedly. The other APL that is operative is the Interim Contract Clause for Cybersecurity Requirements and Unclassified and Sensitive Information. Now, here is the challenge that I have in looking at these APLs, even though they're posted, which suggests they're operative until a formal change. Really, what this codifies is a requirement for a contractor supporting Department of Transportation to have an informa information technology security plan when their information is connected to a network or they're operating inside that network. And that IT security plan has to be within 30 days of contract award, and it must be evaluated six months after award. And there's not only the FISMA, 40 USC, 1133-1, E-Government Act, OMB Circular, Alpha 31, NIST guidelines, DOT order 1630.2. This is somewhat dated because we have seen in the FAR clause side, that's 1252.239, tax 71, that all offers submitted in response to the solicitation must address the approach of completing security plan and accreditation for the TAR clause. Now, why that APL is still operative, um, I didn't have uh, time to be able to clarify that. But most of this in talking to you about the APLs is that that needs to be a one-stop shop when you look at the procure senior procurement executives portal to understand what focus areas, because there could be an APL that is listed tomorrow. And although these are for their own staff, it could have a significant impact. And with the changes on the infrastructure bill and the environmental impact bill that we have going right now, I would weigh uh, an issue that there will be a more stringent application of those APLs as that relates to both of those past acts. And then the last one is contract security. And again, uh, dated again, there has been a number of issuances of these and requirements, but essentially this APL requires personal identi identity verification cards for contractors, and it's on a risk-based personal security processing. That risk base is three levels. Low risk requiring a national agency check or a NAC, medium risk requiring a minimum background investigation or an MDI, and high risk requiring a background investigation. Now, Department of Transportation TAR tells you specifically that you may need to have additional requirements for a security clearance at the confidential secret or top secret level that will be adjudicated by DOD under the NISPOM. 
And that is an important aspect because if your company is not used to going through the NISPOM process for individual clearances or the facilities clearance requirements that NISPOM also requires, that can be a steep learning curve to be able to do as you transition into protecting not only our, our, our supply chain for what supplies this, which is a major endeavor that most all of you are aware of, but in protecting that infrastructure. I talked about the pipeline and hazardous material safety administration and the impact that we had on the freezing of oil distribution that we seen last year. Those are the kinds of things that as we start to have other threats that come to fruition, the Department of Transportation is gonna be pushed um, into being able to provide that level of security. Uh, that would be the end um, of the discussion. Um, I, again, Craig Lawless, uh, Senior Counsel with General Counsel PC, located in McLean, Virginia. Um, our firm does not only government contracts and full scope for that, including bid protests, claims, formations, contract adjudication, dispute resolution. Um, we also have a very robust corporate practice, a robust, very robust litigation practice. Um, we uh, have a employment practice. Uh, I particularly uh, focus on employment issues with inside uh, the government contracting sphere, um, but we have a litany of commercial sector clients as well. And we also have business continuity as practice area that dovetails with our estate planning and a family planning practice as well. If you have any questions that I didn't answer here, I'd be glad to take them either an email or a phone call. Uh, let me know. Please remind me that you attended the session and uh, I wish you all the best in consuming what is a huge resource in Jennifer Shaw's. And I look forward to seeing you online at the Friday session for the business development plan for Department of Transportation. Thank you for the opportunity. Over to you. Thank you, Craig, for such a great presentation. Um, as he said, if you have any questions, there's his contact information. Um, and then Thank you everyone for participating today. The recording and slides from today's webinar will be available very soon within the next 24 hours. Um, and as Craig said, we look forward to seeing you on Friday as we go through the playbook for the Department of Transportation. And um, we'll get more of um, an in-depth look at some of the data from GovSpen, which Craig referenced today. So the registration link for that is on our website as always. We hope to see you there. Have a great rest of your day, and this concludes the webinar. Thank you.